Hello and welcome to chapter 7 of the Eggplant Performance Tutorial Series. Uh, this is the first chapter that's going to be talking about generation rules, uh, which is a pretty important bit of functionality in Eggplant Performance. And so we're actually going to be covering generation rules over the course of several chapters here. Uh, so the first chapter will be dealing specifically with parameterization, uh, which is the process of modifying values input by the user during the recording so that each virtual user instead uh, uses values defined in a test data file instead. Uh, so the example I'll be demonstrating shortly will involve modifying the hard-coded login credentials used in the login script uh, so that we can have each VU login with its own set of credentials. This is because we don't want all of our VUs logging in with the same account and uh, potentially causing havoc when they're trying to uh, check out each other's cards. Uh, in other cases, the application you are testing may simply not support multiple logins uh, with the same set of credentials. Uh, so the scenario of modifying hard-coded login credentials is actually quite a common one in performance testing. So we should be able to condense all of this down into three objectives. So the first one will be to parameterize the login credentials using generation rules. Uh, the second will be to create the test data table. And then the third step will be linking that test data table to an actual test. So let's have a look at number one now. In order to start uh, working with this script uh, with generation rules, uh, we need to either go into this regenerate option because that is in effect what we're wanting to do um, as part of uh, creating a generation rule, that script does need to be regenerated in order to apply it. So uh, the generation rule functionality is actually accessed by uh, doing a re regenerate. Uh, the other option is to define it in the virtual user. So there's a button here, view virtual user, which takes you into workspace mode and selects the custom virtual user. And uh, when you do that, you can also see the generation rules because they are actually stored against the virtual user. Uh, they're not stored with a script or anything like that and that's because you want to be able to reuse these generation rules against multiple recordings and so um, uh, I think it makes more sense to uh, access the generation rules through the regenerate option because that's what you're going to do anyway as soon as you've defined a new generation rule. <clears throat> so this first screen uh, you've probably recognize it from earlier. It's where we defined the extent of a particular script. So our login script is just the first, uh, the second and the third transactions in the overall test recording. Uh, so we don't need to change that. That stays the same. Uh, we just need to hit the next button to, to get to this screen where we can actually uh, define uh, the uh, new generation rules. Uh, there's actually two options here. There's a light bulb uh, that uh, is called the Generation Rules Assistant and uh, there's a, just a, a normal plus button that allows you to add a new generation rule. So when you click the add a new generation rule button uh, you'll see all of the different generation rules that are available and you know this is sort of the starting point where you can uh, define whichever rule you like. Uh, but uh, an alternative, uh, when you're not quite sure what kind of generation rule uh, you need, uh, you can use the light bulb uh, option. So, uh, for example, um, I can start typing in uh, the email address that I use to log in, and there's an autocomplete here that I can click uh, that selects the entire uh, value then, so the entire email address in this case. Uh, so, and, and uh, now I can ask Eggplant Performance to analyze this value and what that does is, is basically tell you where that value came from. Did it come from the server first or was it something that the client sent? Um, you can sort of tell that already just by looking at the numbers here. So uh, request 61 happens before uh, response 62 and so that uh, in itself implies that the value actually came from the client before it was received somewhere else um, uh, from the server and in fact we receive it on the response to to the home page once we're actually logged in as we saw before uh, there's a link that changes to uh, your account name when you're logged in and so that's where that email address is suddenly appearing but that's not the one we actually want to modify we don't want to do anything with that we're just interested in changing it in the form where we're actually submitting uh, the login 
login credentials to the server as part of this post request. And so when I hit analyze, uh, this bit of text, uh, this text box underneath the value or the text to analyze field uh, tells me what's going on. So it's it's detected that this this text was submitted to the server as part of a form. And if I don't always want to send the same value each time, then I should replace it with something else. And that's, that's what's uh, called parameterization. Okay, and going on to the next screen then, uh, this does show the whole list of generation rules again, but uh, all the irrelevant ones, all the ones we're not interested in, are grayed out. Uh, instead, we're left with two options, essentially, for doing that parameterization. And uh, they are either the replace key value rule, which is actually recommended in this case, uh, or replace value. Now, replace key value is recommended because you can change the value without breaking the rule for future recordings. Uh, with it, I can use a completely different set of login credentials and still have the rule apply because it is looking at the key rather than uh, value in order to make the replacement. If you just wanted to change the value regardless of where it appeared, you would use the replace value rule. Okay, so once you've selected the rule and hit next, uh, you'll be asked uh, what the key is in the virtual user's data dictionary. So this isn't the same key that we're talking about on that web form. Uh, this is now uh, the key that Eggplant Performance will use to look up uh, the values that we want to use. So we haven't defined this yet, but uh, username is probably uh, a good identifier for uh, the email address in this case. And we want to apply the rule to all requests by default. You can uh, filter down to just applying the rule uh, in specific places. I'm not expecting this to uh, this rule to apply anywhere but that one login request. So uh, it's okay to leave this on the default. That's it. So there's our generation rule created. Uh, anywhere where we have this email key, we'll now instead change the value uh, to be whatever we fetched from uh, the data source. Uh, so continuing the wizard, uh, that then uh, invokes the regenerate, so um, once that's complete then we should see uh, our script having been updated. So when I switch to Visual Studio it'll like me, likely tell me uh, the script has changed. Let's do that now. There we go. So um, yep, we just want to reload uh, everything basically. And there we go, there's our rule that's kicked in. Uh, that's what the rule looks like. So um, it's made the change from email01 at test.com uh, to get string username. Uh, and it's also put in a little comment to let us know that uh, a rule took, uh, took effect here. Now, we haven't actually created the data file yet, so right now this would actually uh, cause an exception at runtime. So uh, we haven't put any values into the data dictionary that are linked to the username key. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. So if we just go back to the PowerPoint slide, we're now going to deal with step number two, which is to create the test data table. So that's done in the data sources folder. Once you select it, you can right click and the only option you have there is to create a new data source. So that's what we want to do. Now there's essentially two different types of, of uh, data. I won't worry about uh, data files at the moment, um, but the two main uh, types of data are either a data dictionary or a data table. Uh, so a dictionary is a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between the key and uh, a value that it's associated with. Uh, so that's not really what we want. We actually have lots of different values uh, that have to be associated with just a single key. So we want a one-to-many relationship. And in order to do that, we need to create a new data table file. Um, just set that option there. Uh, we give it a name as well. Uh, I think credentials makes uh, for a good name for this kind of data. And hit OK. So all that does is create this node underneath the tree here. If I double click to open that file, um, it just opens this blank CSV file that's now on disk in the default editor. And, and here is where I would then populate my test data. The first row is special, it always indicates what the keys are. Uh, so the key that I, we've chosen in this case is the username. And below it, all the rows below it will be values. So if we want to uh, repeat what was in the original recording, uh, that would uh, this is how we would define this file. 
Let's go ahead and add the other column for the password, which we'll eventually also need. Um, that'll look like this. So this is exactly what was in the recording, but instead of now picking this data from the script itself, uh, we'll be taking this data from the credentials file. However, uh, there is one more step, which is to actually link this credentials file uh, to the test. So just because you've created a data source uh, doesn't mean that this data source is automatically available to all of your scripts. Uh, that's actually undesirable because you might have different sets of data for perhaps different test environments and you want to be able to easily switch between them without having to recreate anything. So, uh, so data sources by default they're not actually available. The step that makes them available to a script is in the test. So you'll, you'll see a test level data tab uh, when you select a test, that's the one we're interested in. There is another place where you can add data, but I'm, I won't go into too much detail on that yet. Uh, for now, we just want to use this data source bindings option here. And that's because if we add data to our test at this level, uh, using this data source binding here, uh, the default policy uh, is for each virtual user to take one row from this file. So that's that's important. That ensures that we won't end up with a virtual user that uh, is using more than one set of credentials, which then might cause conflicts with another virtual user, and your application might not support multiple people logging in with the same account. And so um, assigning data at this level ensures that each virtual user will just use one uh, unique set of credentials from your uh, test data. Uh, we do need to save this whenever you make changes to your test in Studio. In order for Test Controller to recognize those changes, uh, you'll need to uh, press the floppy disk icon up here. So you'll notice that there is a little asterisk on the title bar that indicates that there is an unsaved change. Uh, so go ahead and hit save whenever you see that, and uh, Test Controller will be sure to pick up any changes you've made in, in Studio. Now, because we're not dealing with test controller um, and we're instead doing the debugging in the IDE, um, I do need to repeat this step here of uh, pressing the debug VU group button uh, because, again, the script doesn't know automatically about that test data. Uh, that's something that we uh, effectively uh, tell the debugger script uh, when you press that button. So we're actually regenerating uh, the code for that allows you to run this in the IDE in debug mode. Um, the, the script is now aware of that data file and it will pull uh, the credentials from there. If, it, if it's not, then we'll see an error when we get to our uh, uh, get string command here. And that's because we're not specifying default. So get string uh, is part of our API. Uh, you can either just specify a single parameter, which will be the key that you're looking for. In our case, it is this username value. Um, but you can also specify a default value should uh, that uh, username key not exist. So, you know, this again would um, uh, would end up logging in with email01 at test.com if we haven't defined any data. So you might want to actually use this, uh, this uh, format. Um, but uh, in this case, I didn't use that option. So if I reach this line and I haven't assigned my data properly or there is no username key, uh, then uh, this would actually cause an exception and no such value as exception in this case. So hopefully we won't see that. Hopefully we'll just see uh, the virtual user logging in as email01 at test.com. Actually, let's change it up. Let's actually log in as 02 instead. So I think the password also changes to 02. So now we should suddenly uh, see ourselves logging in on, as a different user. Okay, I haven't created the generation rule for the password yet. Let's just go back and quickly do that. Um, it's more or less going to be the same process as, uh, as was done for the username. Uh, so here we are on the screen. Uh, can start typing in the password there, click analyze, tells me that uh, the text was submitted to the server as part of a form again, that's what I'm expecting to see. Uh, and again, we'll want to use a replace key value rule. And the value we want to look at is, uh, is going to be this one here, that's the name of the key that we've defined for all the password values. And there we go. So if I wanted to use that default option, I would specify this one here. So uh, it'll use a recorded value if I haven't actually specified any password uh, in my data. Apply to all requests and OK, that's it. Hit next and generate. Now when I switch back to Visual Studio, we'll hopefully see um, the data updated. 
the script updated, I should say. There we go. So there's another get string there that's going to look for a key called password and replace this whole lot with whatever value was retrieved from uh, the data dictionary. And if no key exists for password, I will just use password 01, which was the originally recorded value. All right, let's run this again and see what happens. All right, there's our live web recording showing up as well as the event log. It's taking a bit longer to uh, get started here. Uh, looks like it took about eight seconds there to load the home page when it was much faster last time around. All right, this time we've got a warning uh, on the step that uh, is submitting the login. So we're expecting to see an HTML title of your store, but instead uh, we're still on the login page by the looks of it. So uh, something's not quite gone right. Uh, it could be that the user doesn't exist. Let's let's find out. So here's our email address and password being sent, and we're seeing this your store login page. So it, it would appear that we failed to log in. It might be that the user doesn't actually exist. Uh, we're still seeing a register and login link on the page. All right, well, let's debug this. So I can actually go onto the NopCommerce site and see whether or not I can perform this step manually. I mean, it could very well be that this user just doesn't exist. We'll find out in just a moment. Ah, no customer account found, so this, this account doesn't actually exist. Well, I thought it did, but Anyway, I'm not too fast. I'm, I'm happy that we saw an example then uh, uh, of what an error looks like. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it is just a page title warning, but um, more often than not, this is something you need to uh, investigate. You know, the virtual user is basically saying, I'm not on the page I'm expecting to see. Uh, chances are from that point on, you know, if we were actually then trying to do anything with the cart or with that logged in user, those uh, transactions would probably fail as well. So uh, this is uh, telling us that in a, uh, about the w best way possible. I'll now go away and create this user and we'll be right back and we'll just run the script again without making any changes and we should hopefully see it log in. Boom, fast as lightning. We've now got an email 02 at test.com account. I'm going to sign out of it here now and close the browser. So I've uh, just created the account. Let's just literally run this again. Nothing else has changed, I promise. Um, we should hopefully see this login complete successfully now. There we go, we're in the submit login, it's done. Uh, no warning this time, let's have a look. Uh, looks very similar to when we logged in as uh, 01. Uh, so now we're logging in as 02, we're again seeing that redirect happen, promising sign. And now the page title is just your store, we're not on the login page anymore. I was scrolling down and we can see the link has again changed to email02 at test.com. So we've successfully parameterized this script. We're now logging in uh, with the credentials that we define in this simple file here, uh, which we can change whenever we like. We don't have to recompile script code or anything like that. We've completely detached the data from the script code. Uh, and so we can now uh, add as many accounts as we want in here and be able to uh, have each virtual user use just a single row from it. I think that's it for this chapter. Uh, next chapter, we'll hopefully uh, look at some more generation rules examples. So uh, stay tuned for that video to come out. Bye-bye.